Okay, um, thanks very much for inviting me to speak today. Uh, it's always bad speaking after somebody's been talking with lots of amusing slides. So uh, thanks, Seamus, for that. And now uh, it won't be as amusing, but hopefully as be as informative. So we've talked a lot about um, ovarian cancer, and a lot of patients will come to me and say, why don't we screen for ovarian cancer? Why don't we try and detect it much earlier? And unfortunately, we haven't yet got that process in place. And what I'm going to do is talk to you about why we don't yet screen for ovarian cancer. So what is screening? The idea of screening is a process by which unrecognized diseases or defects are identified with tests that can be applied on a large scale to detect these diseases earlier, so detecting them before they become clinically apparent. And often in these situations, if you detect diseases earlier, you catch them at an earlier stage, and therefore the prognosis, the outlook, tends to be better. And this certainly works with cervical screening. And sometimes, sometimes during this presentation, I will refer to cervical screening as a comparison. And we know cervical screening works, but unfortunately, ovarian cancer screening at the moment doesn't work. And we will compare the two as we go along. So the World Health Organization um, published a landmark paper, paper many years ago about the criteria that must be in place before you introduce a screening program. And what we're going to do during the presentation is we're going to go through each of these and we'll talk through them about their applications relative to over ovarian cancer. So first of all, we need to look at the disease itself. So the first thing they said, the disease has to be serious. Now, is ovarian cancer serious? Well, it, of course it is. And we've talked about that already quite a lot. In terms of overall, where, where is ovarian cancer relative to other cancers? On the left-hand graph, we, what we've got is incidence. That's the number of new cases per year in the Irish population. So you see breast cancer is the most common cancer, followed by colorectal tumors, lung and um, bronchus, and then ovary is the fourth most common cancer. So in terms of the number of patients it affects, it affects a lot of patients. If you look on the right-hand graph, that's patients that unfortunately die due to ovarian cancer. So you can see ovarian cancer is still high on the list. It's the fourth um, leading cause of death due to malignancies. If you look at um, cervical cancer, that's well down the list in terms of the number of new cancers and in terms of cancer deaths that goes down even further. But look at endometrial cancer, which is quite interesting which is there, endometrial cancer is relatively common, nearly as common as ovarian cancer, but the number of patients who die from endometrial cancer is right down on the list because we can detect endometrial cancer a lot earlier or it presents itself a lot, of, a lot earlier, but ovarian cancer tends to present itself quite late. When we talk about cancers, we talk about stage. And what is stage? Stage is where the cancer is at the time of diagnosis. And often we use a stage one, two, and three, and four. Those can be subdivided, but we'll stick with the one, two, the three, and the four. So if a cancer is confined to the ovary, it's called the stage one. And if it's gone just a little bit further beyond the pelvis, it's a stage two. In the abdominal cavity, stage three, and further spread, it's a stage four. And what we're really trying to do is we're trying to detect by screening cancers at an early stage, so we're stage one. But let's compare that cervical cancer. When we talk about cervical cancer screening, we shouldn't talk about cervical cancer screening. What we're screening for with the cervix is we're screening for disease before it's a cancer. So when you have a smear, you're trying to detect cancer cells, sorry, trying to detect abnormal cells that are just precancerous before they even become a cancer. And therefore, we treat these ladies and stop them developing cancer. But with ovarian cancer, we have no precancerous stage that we yet know of in detail. Now, the next speaker may disagree with that, but in terms of a clinical useful tool, we have no precancerous stage. So if we're going to try and cure patients with, by screening, we've got to detect these cancers at stage one before the cancer has spread. And these are survival curves, which we've seen a little bit of already. So on the left-hand column, we have the percentage of patients who are alive, 100% at the top. And then if you look at the stages, so the blue line, you can see 
that the early stage cancers that present early, these patients tend to live a long time and the worse the presentation in terms of stage, the survival is worsened. So what we're trying to do is trying to pick up cancer at stage one. We haven't got a precancerous stage, unfortunately, therefore we must pick it up at stage one if we're going to introduce a screening program. So in terms of going back to the serious nature of it, it affects one in 70 women, which is quite a lot. But the problem is that 70% of patients are presenting at a late stage, at stage three or stage four. And their survival is not as good as those patients that present at stage one. Therefore, we should be trying to catch it at stage one. So in terms of where we are on the first slide, is this a serious disease? Yes, it is. The next thing is we've got to have a high prevalence of a preclinical stage. And what that means is we've got to have a lot of patients in a community that have the cancer but don't yet know about it. So if you introduce a screening test, we can pick up these patients before they're symptomatic. And there's got to be a lot of those patients around to make the test worthwhile. The problem is that in terms of new cancer patients, if I took 100,000 women walking down the street, only 15 of those patients will have a cancer within that year. So in other words, if we, we would have to do 6,600 tests, whatever this screening test is going to be, to detect one cancer. So in terms of resources, whatever screening test we're going to use, be it a scan, be it a blood test, we have to do that 6,600 times to detect one cancer. And that's assuming that the cancer we're going to detect is a stage one. And it probably won't be. It may be a stage three or stage four. So in terms of resources, trying to implement a test, you've got to do lots and lots of tests to detect that one cancer. So in other words, we don't have a high incidence of a preclinical stage. The next thing is, and I think in some ways is the most important um, thing we're going to talk about is the natural history of the disease. First of all, we're talking about ovarian cancer if it's, it's just one cancer. It's not. Ovarian cancer is lots of cancers. And just to throw a spanner in the works, and we'll probably hear this in the next talk, we talk about ovarian cancers. Probably a lot of these cancers are not ovarian cancers. They're in fact floping tube cancers, just to confuse it. Okay? But we'll talk about ovarian cancers because they're a similar, a similar thing. So it's not one type of cancer, lots of different types of ovarian cancers. This is a, a summarized list, and this could be subdivided even further, but there are lots of different cancers we're dealing with, and therefore they behave differently and they present differently. And therefore already when we're talking about understanding the cancer, well, we're talking about lots of different cancers right from the start. We talked about the progress of cancer from stage one to two to three to four. Now, I'm sure there are some ovarian cancers that do that. So they start off as an early cancer in the ovary, and they begin to spread within the pelvis, and eventually it spreads to the abdomen, and eventually it spreads to outside the abdomen. However, unfortunately, there's a lot of evidence that this isn't the case. Some cancers, of course, ovarian cancers will do that. Cervical cancers do this. So they start off as an early pre-cancer, and then they spread to a stage one, and then to a stage two, and stage three, and stage four. And we understand the natural history of cervical cancer, but we do not yet really understand the natural history of ovarian cancer. So the majority of patients, certainly I don't believe, go from a one to a two to a three to a four. And why do I say that? Well, first of all, we know that benign ovarian cysts don't turn malignant, so it's not that we could do a screening test to try and spot benign cysts and then take them out to stop them becoming cancer. A few exceptions there, but generally we can't do that. And one of the reasons we think that we don't go through stage one to two to three to four is there are lots of case reports of people, for example, somebody with a strong family history of ovarian cancer that may undergo screening and therefore they have a blood test maybe in a scan and that scan is perfectly normal and then three months later they present with symptoms and have another scan and they have a stage three ovarian cancer. So it develops either very, very quickly or it never went through that stage of one to two. It just went straight as stage three 
and I'm a firm believer that's the case. So there'll be some gene that switches on or off that Seamus was talking about that suddenly means you're predisposed to a cancer that is already present throughout the whole of the abdomen. And therefore, trying to introduce a screening test to detect stage ones, well, you're not going to get that because they don't go through stage ones in a lot of cases. And this is a large study where they compared patients with a stage one ovarian cancer at presentation compared with a stage three ovarian cancer. And they looked at the um, differences between the two groups. So remember, talked about ovarian cancer being lots of different disease processes or disease types. So in theory, if a cancer went through stage 1 to 2 to 3 to 4, then the groups that you're at stage 1 to stage 3 should be sort of essentially similar in terms of the types of cancer we've got. So the arrow there, you can see that the patients who presented at stage 1 had what we call a serous type tumour, 17% of them, but the patients at stage 3, 80% of those patients had a... Um, had a serious type tumour. In other words, the patients in the stage 3 group were completely different from the stage 1 group, but they should be the same. There should be no difference there, suggesting that stage 1 ovarian cancer patients are different from stage 3 ovarian cancer patients. And if you look at some of the other tumours, for example, the endometrioid tumours, the majority of those in this study were the stage 1, and we do find that endometrioid tumours often do present at stage 1, and therefore, we think that they may be one of the groups that does go from stage 1 to 2 to 3 to 4, but the serous types don't. And unfortunately, the serous types are one of the most common tumours. And the next thing you would expect is that the bigger the tumour, the more likely it will have spread. If you look here, the patients in the stage 1 group, the size of their tumours was actually smaller than the stage 3 group. Now, that's not right. If you're expecting to go from 1 to 2 to 3 to 4, you expect the cancers, the cysts, to be smaller in the stage 1 group than they would be in the stage 3 group, and they're not. It's the other way around. Therefore, important take-home message, at the moment, we don't understand the natural history of ovarian cancer. And that's one of the most important take-home messages because trying to introduce a screening test to try and stop it or prevent it earlier, we can introduce that unless we know that natural history. But hopefully in the next talk, we'll hear about how we are beginning to understand a little bit more about the natural history. Now, if we look at this thing called lead time, there's a couple of little slides here. We're going to talk about lead time and length time bias. And what we're doing here is, imagine we've introduced a new screening test, and we're trying to test that in the community to see if it works. And the problem is, if you introduce a screening test, and you're kind of trying to compare it, see if it works, you get lots of biases involved in these tests. So, for example, if you screen 100 women... Um, for ovarian cancer, and you're comparing those with a group of 100 women who, who are not screened, you compare the two groups and see how they get on. And one of the problems about doing those tests is you get something called length time bias. And that's a form of selection bias where you're comparing slow-growing tumours fast, versus faster-growing tumours. And again, Seamus alluded to this, so there are different sorts of ovarian cancers. If you've got these slowly developing cancers, these will be picked up by ovarian cancer screening, and therefore you're picking up these slow-growing cancers that in fact are slow-growing and probably wouldn't have had a problem with, the, with you, probably wouldn't have developed a problem in the first place, and therefore you pick them up, you cure them, whereas the more aggressive tumours present a little bit late. And therefore, you're likely to pick up more in a study, you're more likely to pick up slowly growing tumours, and therefore your study will suggest that by being screened you do better, because these tumours are going to behave better anyway, and therefore you're biasing your results. So any screening test, any screening study that has been done, has always had this, this bias involved in this. And this is related to something called lead time bias. So imagine we have um, a couple of patients. The patient here and this patient gets a cancer, and they go through a process where they're screened, and the cancer is picked up here, they get treatment, unfortunately the patient eventually dies. Now compare with that the patient at the bottom that isn't screened. Now imagine this was a big study, and therefore we're compa comparing the screen group with a non-screen group, and what you want to know is about survival. So do the screen group patients live longer, than the non-screen group. Well, if you did this study, what you'll find is that this patient in the screen group lived from this amount of time to this amount of time, and therefore had a longer survival than the 
patient that wasn't screened, whether the cancer detected was, the cancer detected was here, unfortunately they, they died there. So what it's saying is that just because you're detecting a cancer early doesn't necessarily alter survival. But if you are doing a big screening trial to compare your screening test, this bias will influence you because often what you're doing is you're detecting cancers earlier that is actually not necessarily affecting the long-term survival. So these two things, when you're introducing a screening test, you have to test for these and remove them from your screening group um, um, trials to not uh, influence the trial outcomes due to bias. Now, we've talked about the disease. It's definitely serious. We unfortunately don't have a high prevalence of a preclinical stage. We don't understand the natural history, and any test we do will be biased in its results. So let's look about what tests are available and how they're important. What tests do we have at the moment? Well, really at the moment, all we have is an ultrasound scan and a blood test called the CA125. Now, the CA125 um, is very easily done. It's just a blood test. And we'll talk about that a little bit later. But hopefully, in the future, there'll be more blood tests available, which may be more accurate. And I use the word accurate very loosely. So a diagnostic test has to be sensitive and specific. Now, these are very important words, often used interchangeably, and they, they, they shouldn't. If we do a test, for example, a scan or a blood test, it's very easy to think it's black and white. Yes, it's positive or it's negative, and that's not the case. And when you do any test, there are different uh, scenarios of what that result can be. So if you look at the left-hand side, let's say we've got a test that is positive. Test positive. What can that mean? Well, it could be that the patient does have the disease. In other words, it's a true positive. And therefore, um, what you want is um, a few... Uh, what, what you want is a test that has a high percentage of true positive results. And in other words, it's highly sensitive. And what you don't want with that test is a lot of um, patients who are tested that test negative but have the disease. So in other words, um, you want to pick up as many cancers as you possibly can by that test. Now, if you test negative, then unfortunately some of those patients will have the disease. They're tested negative and they're false negatives. And therefore, that would suggest that a test isn't very accurate. So sensitivity is a, the measure of how accurate the test is in detecting the disease. And not all tests are perfect. And what specificity is, is a measure of how often a test will pick up a patient who has no disease but will test positive. In other words, the test is positive, but the disease is absent, so it's a false positive. And unfortunately, a test may have an elevated result, but those patients don't have disease, so you're falsely labeling the patient as having a cancer when they haven't. And that's called specificity. So if you're introducing a test, you want high sensitivity, in other words, you can detect the cancers that you're looking for, and you want high specificity, in other words, you want as very few patients as possible being labelled as having a disease when they don't. The problem is that sensitivity and specificity are related, and if you increase the sensitivity on one test, you automatically will decrease the specificity, and therefore you're trying to find a balance. So. Let's just take an example here. Let's have a, suppose somebody invents a new blood test. It, this could be CA125, but it could be some new blood test. And what we're going to do is we're going to, first of all, look at the patients that don't have the disease. So there's the number of patients, and this is our tumor marker here. So we want a low level here. In other words, the majority of patients who don't have the disease have a low level of this marker. But unfortunately, all healthy patients will sometimes, some healthy patients will sometimes have an elevated result. So even the patients that are healthy, they may have an elevated result. If you look at a population who have the disease, then in theory, the test should have very few patients with a low level of this test, but a lot of patients who have the cancer will test positive. 
And we've got, these are the two curves you'd expect. This is, happens with CA125 and will probably happen with any other test that's being introduced. So we have to take a cutoff level somewhere of what we're labeling as abnormal and what we're labeling as normal. So, for example, let's take the cutoff level here uh, as A, as what we're going to call normal. So if we look here, if we take the cutoff level as A, we're going to detect all these patients under the red graph as having the disease, and we're just going to miss a few of these patients. But if we have the cutoff level here, what we're saying is the blue line, which are the normal patients, all these patients here are going to be labeled as having disease when they don't. So let's move the line a little bit further and say, well, move the curve, move the cutoff point a little bit higher and have your level of cutoff a little bit higher. But fortunately, if you move that cutoff higher, you're going to miss these patients here. In other words, you're not going to label these patients as having cancer when they do. But even by raising the cutoff level, what you've done is labeled less patients who don't have the disease as positive. So in other words, if you increase the sensitivity, you decrease the specificity. And that's a lot of the problems, particularly with CA125, is you get these elevated results that are false positives. And therefore, a test must be highly sensitive and highly specific, and we don't have that at the moment. Particularly if you look at ovarian um, scanning, we can scan for an ovarian cyst, and we can't tell by looking at that cyst whether it's cancer or whether it's benign. They can give you a hint, but they can't tell you that, and therefore it's not particularly specific. Relatively sensitive, but not very specific. So, in terms of our diagnostic tests, which we don't have, but let's say if we're using scans and CA125, is it simple and cheap doing that? Well, doing a CA125 is actually relatively cheap, and it's relatively simple. It's a blood test, and anybody can do a blood test, and it can be processed in a laboratory where it's automated and relatively cheap, and therefore it becomes a reliable test because you've got something to audit it against. But if we're talking about doing ultrasound scans, well, are they simple? No, they're not. You need to train individuals to do those scans. Are they cheap? No, they're not. You have to um, pay for the equipment and also pay for the training and for the upkeep of the equipment and for the continuation of the, of the radiologist or the ultrasonographer. And are, there, uh, are ultrasound scans reliable? Well, they're reliable in terms of, yes, they're not going to break down. So you've got a test that, that is, is you're able to, to turn the scan machine on and it works. But in terms of the um, overall cost, it's very expensive. Now, cost, you should argue, isn't important in this situation. Well, unfortunately, it is. Um, cost is important for lots of different, different reasons. And if we're introducing a screening test, you have to introduce some sort of cost effectiveness of it. Now, weighing up what is cost effective or not is very difficult. If you get a lady who has ovarian cancer that needs surgery and chemotherapy, et cetera, that's a huge cost to the medical services as well as, the, um, as, as well as to herself and her family. And therefore, you'd have to weigh up those costs depending on, on what the um, cost for the scans and things were. So we don't have a diagnostic test that is sensitive and specific, and really performing ultrasounds is not that simple. So if we look at the diagnosis and the treatment, well, are there facilities available? So if we have a screening test that is positive, have we got the facilities there to deal with those patients? And essentially what that would mean would coming in for surgery to remove the ovary or to biopsy the ovary or do something to try and prove whether this is an ovarian cancer or not. Now, with cervical cancer screening, that's relatively simple because the cervix is, is accessible with an examination in the outpatient setting. So you can see the cervix, you can look at it, and you can biopsy it. Not particularly pleasant, but it doesn't require a general anaesthetic, and it's a safe thing to do. If you need to access the ovary, once you've got your scan that's abnormal or your blood test that's abnormal, the only way of accessing it, as we've, as Eileen said previously, it's deep in the pelvis, is to do surgery. And that surgery would involve either keyhole surgery, a laparoscopy, or um, an open surgery to try and sample that ovary. And when I say sample the ovary, what we're talking about, well, you could biopsy the ovary. Well, you could do, but if that ovary is a cyst, and you think the cancer's in the cyst, in other words, a stage one, which is what you're trying to find, if you biopsy that cyst, potentially you could rupture the cyst, and therefore potentially you could seed the cancer. So therefore, if you're really worried about that cyst, in fact, you have to take the ovary out. And therefore, you're removing the ovary, which is 
obviously could have implications if somebody um, wishes to maintain their fertility. So even if we spot somebody that may have ovarian cancer, the implications are quite serious in terms of needing surgery and how you sample the ovary. Now, if the, are the facilities available? Well, if we found a screening test that was useful, then we would have to make those screening, that those facilities for treatment and diagnosis available. Um, and uh, that was something that the healthcare system would have to, have to take on board. Um, is it acceptable to have a laparoscopy for a benign cyst, well, for a cyst which is query benign or query malignant? Well, we have to make it acceptable if we find a screening test that is effective. So, the diagnosis and treatment requires surgical intervention. There's a risk of overtreatment, so often we're removing benign cysts. And a lot of my theatre lists at the moment are just involved taking out benign cysts, which are query malignant. And they're not, which is great, but that's surgical intervention and risk for the patient. Um, and sometimes what we're doing when we're screening patients is all we're doing is detecting stage 3 and stage 4 ovarian cancer. And that's not what we're trying to detect. We're trying to detect stage 1 ovarian cancer. And really getting a screening test to just to find stage 3 over or 4 ovarian cancer isn't good enough. And therefore we have to look at does the treatment affect overall survival. And there is a cost involvement, but again cost is relative. And the cost would have to be undertaken if it was going to be beneficial for the patient and beneficial for society. So in summary, we don't understand the natural history of the disease. We have no precancerous stage of ovarian cancer that is yet clinically useful. There may be, but it's not that's been recognized as clinically useful or clinically applicable, whereas cervical cancer we do. We have a low incidence in the population. We have poor sensitivity and specificity of any tests that we have got. How often do you screen? We have capital outlay and running costs. Um, and at the moment, from the screening tests that have been done, there's no real evidence that it affects survival. There are two huge trials that have gone on or are finished, but are under um, analysis at the moment, called the UK FOX and UK TOX. These are big screening studies performed in the UK, which we await the long-term um, results from. These are superb studies in terms of the numbers involved, sort of 20,000 patients where they've looked at screening with ultrasound and CA125, sequential CA125s. And the results, the final results are not, not out yet. I fear, unfortunately, that the results will not be helpful in terms of it won't show a beneficial effect to the screening program that they've introduced. I may be wrong, and I'm hoping I'm wrong, but I don't think it will. But what is superb about these studies is that they have a blood bank. So these patients were followed up for sort of five, ten years, and they've got a huge blood bank going back years. This blood is being stored, so you have a huge database of blood samples, which means that if somebody introduces a new screen test, which hopefully we might hear about in the next talk, we can then go back and use that blood test on those samples um, that have been collected from years ago, and therefore, rather than doing a test that's going to take another 10 years, we've got those blood samples from 10 years previously, and we can look at those and see if that screening test works. And this is where the future is. It's not CA125 and ultrasound, unfortunately. It's another screening test that we're going to have to introduce. Thank you very much.